want to welcome everybody today. Um, we have a, a great, great talk today, uh, as you can see on the screen. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm really grateful because as we go through what we're all going through and experiencing right now, it's going to take a, a lot for us to rebuild in the future, you know, when we're, when we're past this, right? I mean, we've got a lot of things to think about and a lot of ways that we can help each other. Um, and so, you know, this is the first of, of a couple we have uh, coming up. Uh, how we can and get more people and how we can help more people and enjoy and be introduced to the sport that we all love. So we have, you know, today with you, Jenny, and we have, um, you know, adaptive and youth rowing and how we can we build more bridges there. And Arshay Cooper will be on in a couple of weeks and we'll talk about diversity and, and our sport. So we have so many great topics and you get to start off and uh, carry the banner today. Dr. Jenny, and we're really excited. And I know you've got extensive um, experience in the field and you're more than welcome to tell everybody your background um, uh, or you're more than welcome to, we can get right into it. And uh, I wanna encourage everybody to ask questions. Uh, in the Q and A below, you'll see a place where you can put your questions. And um, we understand, we were just talking about how we, we, Jenny and I were raised by dads who have these one size fits all bits of advice. Um, and we know that everybody on this call comes from a different background and a different place and masters, juniors, size of the clubs, the wealth of the community and so on. So um, please ask your question and we'll see if we can find some common ground for everybody. So Jenny, without further ado, welcome and thank you so much for giving us your day. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jenny Whitcomb and I'm going to be talking to you about cultural humility and intelligence. Um, I, my, my logo is up there for Withicombe Consulting. Um, my my full-time job is actually, I'm in charge of health and physical education for Portland Public Schools. And uh, we also run an ERG Ed program, which I'll talk a little bit about as we go. Um, but uh, before that, uh, and, and still a little bit, I, I am a consultant with mostly colleges, um, but I've worked a lot with U.S. Rowing over the years on diversity and inclusion in athletics. And, and that's my primary background is how do we create more diverse and inclusive spaces in athletic programs? As I said, I've, I've focused primarily, primarily at the college level, but have, have kind of talked about it um, from, a, from a range of experiences. So I've um, worked with colleges and universities and organizations all over the U.S. Um, and, and some abroad. Um, so I'm happy to, um, you know, offer uh, what advice uh, I have and, you know, different experiences that I've heard uh, throughout my work. So uh, we will get started. Um, one of the things that I want to lay out there, anytime you're going to do work around diversity and inclusion, it, you know, it's a tough topic to talk about in sport. A lot of folks feel that it, you know sport exists in this that level playing field, and you know we exist outside of um, what's happening in the real world. And and so when we start talking about diversity and inclusion, it can it can make people really uncomfortable. And so when you have these conversations, it's really important to have group agreements, and that's what I'm kind of setting up here. Um, one is to stay engaged. Sometimes uh, when I would go in and do workshops with colleges or universities. Um, you know, some folks are there because they're really interested. They want to know more about how they can create diverse and inclusive spaces for their teams or for their departments. Um, and other times folks are forced to be there, you know, um, they're required to be there and they're not excited to be there. And so, um, you know, we really have to push ourselves to stay engaged and, and to kind of that suspend that disbelief. Um, you know, there is a lot to be said for creating more diverse and inclusive spaces. Uh, it's a huge benefit to our teams, to our athletes and coaches, to our organizations. Uh, and we'll talk about that, but, uh, but we want to work to stay engaged. It's very important that you experience some discomfort. It can be really difficult to have these conversations. Um, the fact of the matter is that rowing is a predominantly white, higher socioeconomic status sport. Uh, and if we want to create a more diverse and inclusive space, we're going to have to make change. And some of that change is uncomfortable and having those conversations can be uncomfortable. So um, it is okay to experience discomfort. And, and in fact, that means that we're pushing ourselves and that we're working towards change. It's important that we speak our truth and remembering that our truth is ours and ours alone. We cannot speak for all of any one group. 
Um, and so the stories that I share with you are things that I have heard or experienced throughout um, my work. Um, and, and I can only speak from my perspective. I can't speak from the perspective of all, of all folks. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, and then expect and accept non-closure. As much as I want to provide um, you know, as many answers as I can, um, there are some things that we just have to work through and are, we're not always going to end um, with, with a for sure answer. Uh, a lot of this work around inclusion comes from you working with your clubs, your athletes, your coaches, talking to them and finding out what sorts of things need to change or need to be different. Um, you're going to have to engage in your own needs assessment, so to speak. Um, to, to work through some of these issues. And so I might not have the answer um, and you might feel like, oh, but now what? Um, but I, hopefully I'll leave you with some of the steps that you can engage in to begin this work on your own in your own organizations. And just to, to reiterate this idea of suspending disbelief, um, what I wanna lay out right from the beginning is when we talk about diversity and inclusion, who delivers the message? often changes what we hear. So for example, I am a white woman um, and I have done work in diversity and inclusion for many years. And as a white woman doing this work, when I talk about race, I am more likely to be believed. So if I say there is an issue in sport that we are not, um, that people of color struggle in sport, particularly sports that are predominantly white dominated. And in fact, they might experience racial oppression in those sports. I am more likely to be believed because I am white. And this is a really difficult thing to, to hear because oftentimes when I do work in diversity and inclusion, um, there, a person of color on this staff had been saying the exact same thing that I had been saying. I'm not saying anything earth shattering. Um, and and then and nobody believes them, right? And then, then I come in and say it and, and everyone's just like, oh, really? You know, and it's so, it is so frustrating. And yet um, when we talk about like gender, if I come into an organization and I say, you know, we really need to think about the experiences of female athletes um, at this institution, they're experiencing discrimination. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh, here we go, the feminist, right? Um, and so, you know, what I'm getting at is that for some reason, if the person who's speaking is aligned with the group that they're speaking about, right, we, we're written off, right? Um, you know, but if, we, if we're, we're not aligned with that group, then we're more likely to be believed. And so it's, it's really difficult. We really have to think about how when people say there's something that we need to be doing here, um, it doesn't matter what their background is, their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, their, their ability status, we need to be listening, right? Um, and so we need to suspend that initial um, reactivity uh, and, and suspend that disbelief and really listen to what folks are saying. Uh, and so that's something that's really important uh, to call out. And it's also important to recognize that, that as a white person, I only know of my experience in rowing or in sport from that perspective. Um, I cannot speak to the experience of a person of color in rowing. I can, I can speak to the experience of myself as a woman in rowing or as an able-bodied rower. Um, but I, you know, that's, it's also important that we recognize that there are limits to what I can know um, about the experience of someone in rowing, especially from different types of diverse um, perspectives. So um, just kind of wanting to lay that out as an important starting point. Um, so a little bit about my rowing background, because I think that does, um, you know, uh, definitely explain kind of where I'm coming from. So I am currently a master's rower. Um, this is my, my team in both pictures there. Um, we do a row every year on January the 1st called Head of the Year. And, uh, and so that's, that's us uh, in, on the water. And then um, we also dress up for holidays. So that is us on a St. Patrick's Day. Um, and I absolutely love my team. 
we're a small master's club. Um, we just, we don't teach rowing. We, we, we only do, um, we only take experienced rowers. Um, and we really are like a family. Um, I started rowing in college. I was a cross country runner. Um, and uh, I, had, I didn't even know anything about rowing. And the coach was like, hey, tall girl, right? And uh, <laughs> so um, I started rowing in college and I absolutely loved it. Um, it. It really has been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I've been rowing for 21 years. There are people on my team who've been rowing for 50 years. <laughs> um, you know, we range in age from 23, 24, all the way uh, up to 75, 76. Um, and it's just a really great uh, team. And, you know, when we think about rowing, and I think about my own rowing experience across the years, um, having been a rower and a coach, um, I am the women's captain right now, um, you know, I think about all the different experiences that I've had and ways that I have experienced diversity in rowing across my time um, and how that is similar to and a little bit different from inclusion. So, for example, when I started rowing in college um, and I was at a, a small uh, private liberal arts college, um, you know, I come from a working class background. I was, you know, the first in my family to go to college and you know, to join a rowing program that was almost exclusively um, pretty well off athletes, um, you know, who, uh, you know, had, had either knew about rowing, had a rowing background, or, um, you know, joining the sport of rowing was not a big lift for them because this was already kind of a, a especially economically speaking, was a world that they came from. Um, it was, it was, it was a challenge because it was very different for me um, you know, we would travel and we would have to pay for our own food and, you know, and uh, different things like that. And that was, that was a, a lift for me. Um, if we were going to go travel somewhere, right, we would have to pay for that at that time. And, and those were big lifts for me that, that weren't lifts for, for my teammates. And so seeing some of those dynamics, um, you know, started kind of opening my eyes to the sport and to some of the different, um, the different ways that diversity diversity played out. Um, over the years, I've also studied sport and diversity and inclusion in sport. And so um, getting to talk with athletes and coaches um, about their experiences and, uh, and a, obviously a particular interest in rowing um, and how it, it uh, how much it brought to me and how important I think it is to uh, encourage others to experience it. It's something you can do across the lifespan. But if we're going to do that, it's not enough just to create a diverse space. Um, we also have to create a really inclusive space, and, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, um, but I wanted to introduce you to my team, Willamette Rowing Club, and I want to give them a shout out because I love them. They're my family. Uh, we we did our erg Zoom today, so uh, anyway, that's that's where I'm coming from. So. It's important that we define some of the language that we're going to use. Um, culture is a really important one to, to call out right from the start. I think that a lot of times we think of cultures in, in the very big macro sense, right? So place of origin. Um, but our culture, we, we exist in multiple cultures simultaneously, right? So um, your neighborhood usually has a culture. Um, your club will have a culture, your team will have a culture, even certain lineups have cultures. Um, and if you've coached, you know that. Uh, and when people come in and out of those cultures, the culture shifts, right? Especially when I work with like college teams, you have seniors graduate out, freshmen come in and the culture shifts of the team slightly. Um, certainly we, when we're the person in charge, whether we're captain, coach, you know, um, the organizational lead, uh, president, you know, whatever it might be, we try to set the tone of the culture, but then, you know, the, the athletes themselves also bring certain aspects that, that shift the culture, um, and we kind of find a way to work those things together. There's also a lot of shared language around culture, rowing itself. There are a number of t-shirts out there that explain that we have our own culture, um, things like up to and to. You just say that to a stranger walking across the street and they're not going to know what you mean, but uh, if they do, you know they're a rower. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's a culture in and of itself. So culture really is any space where we have those shared experiences, a shared language, stories, um, community. And, uh, and so we exist in multiple cultures simultaneously. And we actually shift our language and how we act uh, and speak, um, you know, seamlessly as we move through. The way I act at work is going to be different than the way I act at home, which is different than the way I act at practice. Um, you know, there's going to be certain things that are that are similar, um, but we we just adjust, right? We speak just that slightly different language as we come in and out of these different cultures. Diversity is any way in which we differ, and so. That could be our sex, our, the way we present our gender, our sexuality, our race, our ability status, our age, whether we're a port or starboard, that's really the most important one, um, starboards. And, uh, and so diversity is any way in which we differ, but it's important to realize that certain aspects of difference have been selected throughout history to have more meaning than others. So, while in the rowing world, whether you're a port or starboard means quite a bit uh, to us as rowers, uh, in the in the big wide world, it doesn't it doesn't usually mean as much, right? But things like age or ability or sexuality or race, those things have been plucked out and assigned meaning. And so, whether or not we you know we want it to have the significance that it does. That's, that's the world that we live in. And then, so our sex does matter. Our race does matter. Um, and just because sport, you know, we, we want to think about sports level playing field doesn't mean that it is. Um, you know, we come to practice with our identities and, uh, and those things, like I said, they have meaning. And so we, we want to recognize that. Um, diversity, or I guess I should say inclusion, is not about erasing that diversity. It's about embracing that diversity. Um, and so that's where the distinction comes in with inclusion. So it's not just about creating a more diverse space, it's also creating an inclusive space. So that means making sure that everybody feels seen and valued and heard, um, that, that you are a team, that you are a, a family. Um, and and that's, that's the distinction. If, if you think about diversity, people often think about quantity. They think, well, we need to get more of this group, right? So if, if rowing is, you know, predominantly white, it's predominantly higher SES, um, it's predominantly able-bodied, then we want to get more, uh, you know, more ability diversity, we want to get more racial diversity, we want to get more economic diversity. Um, you can go out and try to increase your numbers, but if you don't create an inclusive space, a, a place where people feel valued and heard, they're not going to stay. And uh, all you're going to do is you're just going to kind of recycle those numbers over and over and over again. It's something that a lot of colleges and universities face, um, you know, let's say they stay at like 2% racial diversity over and over and over again, it never changes. And that's because there's not enough focus being placed on the inclusion. Are you making sure that all of your members feel valued and included and heard? And sometimes the only way to do that is to say, what does everybody need? You know, what does everybody want uh, so that they can feel included and valued and heard? And a lot of times it's very simple things. I've worked, like I said, with a number of organizations. Sometimes it is, rotating who gets to pick the music that you earn to or that you listen to in the weight room. Um, you know, sometimes it is, uh, you know, different stretches that you do. Uh, if you do a team night, where you go to eat, are you, are you making sure that everybody is getting a chance to have a voice? Um, that's the way that we grow uh, and, and, get, and get folks to stay. Um, so it's more than just saying we need to we need to have more of any particular group we need to make sure we're making the most of their experience and that will get them to stay and that will help us grow you want to start with inclusion you don't want to start with diversity um, so that's kind of how we're going to use those words as we go through the idea of cultural humility is about being culturally humble 
it's not weak. It's, it's not submissive. It is recognizing that we cannot know another person's culture, right? Um, they are the one who know their, their culture the best. Um, and so it's being humble enough to recognize that and to ask questions um, and to learn more. Um, we always have to recognize that we, we will adhere to unconscious stereotypes and you know, um, unconscious bias. And I know that's really hard for a lot of folks to hear because we wanna say, well, no, I'm not biased. We all have biases. I've been doing this work a long time. I make mistakes. I have biases. I come from a certain background, growing up a certain way, um, having certain experiences. And it's not, rather than say, oh no, I don't have biases. It's, it's a better starting point for us to say, we all have biases. We need to take time to understand what are our biases and how are they impacting, um, you know, our, our, our goals or our values. So if your goal is to create a more diverse and inclusive team, then you've got to sit down and ask yourself, what are some of the biases that I hold? And sometimes you, you don't know until you have uh, an experience and you start to walk away from that experience and you're like, wow, why did I react that way? Um, you know, so um, then you kind of have to ask yourself, how do I deal with that? Why, where did that come from? What do I do next? Um, because recognizing unconscious bias and adhering to, you know, recognizing that we might un, um, adhere to unconscious stereotypes, that's a lifelong process um, because it's unconscious. So we're not always able to just pull them out and un unpack them right then. So it's also realizing that people are complex. We are all made up of many different identities. Um, we exist in many different cultures, um, whether they're race or gender or class or age or ability. Um, you know, there, there is no um, two people alike, right, in that sense. And so we have to honor that many of us are existing in many spaces at all times. And what culture humility really at the core is about is not only that recognition that there are a lot of differences in your members or your teammates um, and that you you know we don't want to assign that unconscious bias to anybody but it's also about working to increase our own self-awareness and to learn more about others and you know it's it's that being humble enough to recognize that you don't know what you don't know and that's an important, it's an important thing to, to do. Um, and it is a lifelong process. It's not something that we achieve and then we're, we're good, right? So it's always about working on self-awareness, um, recognizing our own biases and perceptions um, and, and how we are going to use those, our knowledge and understanding of that to create more diverse and inclusive spaces. So a lot of it is a lot of self-work um, about what we are bringing as leaders um, to, to our field or to our sport or to our team or organization. So how do we start? So first thing is the level of the problem, right? Um, we do not want to get into this place about feeling guilty. If you're looking at your team and you're going, wow, everyone on my team is white. I'm doing a bad job. Is we're not the, the whole point about having a conversation around diversity and inclusion is not to make people feel guilty. Um, you know, when when uh, I was asked to add an adaptive program to our, our our team, I said no, I'm a bad person. No, this is not about guilt. It's about recognizing. Well, why did you say no? What was what was going on there that that caused you concern? Right. It's about developing that that cultural intelligence. It's about recognizing from here on. What are some of the decisions that I've made? What are the, some of the thoughts that I've had that have impacted the level of diversity or inclusion in, in my team? Um, you know, and so that's where we need to start is we need to say there's an issue, right? And then we need to challenge our thinking. Um, the fact is we live in a racist, sexist, classist, ageist, homo and transphobic society, uh, ableist, it, that is normalized in our society. And I know that those words carry a lot of weight. 
and that that are that we are often defense and saying no but that might be society but that's not me or that's not my club it's it's not, it may not be you it may not be your club but the fact that those structures exist in our society then they're going to exist in our sport whether we intend them to or not um, there is so much systemic racism and sexism and ableism in our society that we don't even see anymore because it's been normalized. We don't even know to look for it. Uh, it's, it's, it's simply there. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's not about, you know, putting up the, the wall and saying, okay, nope, not me. It's about saying, all right, we are part of a sport that has a very long history, right? And throughout that history, sport in general, rowing is not a, you know, um, uh, is not free from it either, uh, has certain pieces of it, right, that are embedded, that become racist, sexist, classist, right? And so how do we start to see those, right? How do we make what's invisible visible? Um, and it's not about forcing anyone to believe any one thing, but it's just about challenging us to reflect on why we might believe what we what we do right um you know maybe someone is afraid uh i'm afraid to have older members because what if something happens right why do we believe that way is it all about the quote liability or is it is there something more right what is our fear where is it coming from um so that's where it goes with open dialogue. So a lot of it is about having conversations and creating a, a safe space for people to freely engage in a conversation. One of the hardest things to do when you hear something that makes you want to be defensive is to not say anything, is to just listen. Uh, and a lot of it is about having conversations and listening to the answer. So if, if a club is saying, you know, the female members in this club feel like we're secondary to the, the male members of this club, the reaction sometimes is being, uh, -uh right? It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. This is how the members are feeling. So what can you do about that? What, where is that, where is that experience coming from for them and, and listening to that and having that open dialogue, right? Um, so all of that is really important and it takes a lot of self-reflection to be able to get to that point. And then inspiring leadership. So how do you empower folks to be leaders uh, in your team and on your team and in your organizations and within your club? Um, not just one person, not just the same few people, but how do you encourage lots of folks to um, take on different leadership roles throughout? Um, because that, again, it's going to enhance because you're bringing more perspectives to the table. Uh, and, and you never know. Again, you don't know what you don't know. At this time of COVID, um, you know, our club, as soon as we had to be off the water, um, you know, we, we just, we, we got a, a practice started right away with, with Zoom. So we all are at the same time on Zoom. Um, and, you know, and that was just one of the things that we did. And then we started talking about, oh, you know what? We usually go to coffee on Saturdays and Sundays after practice. We need to do a, a virtual coffee hour. And so someone else gets us set up with virtual coffee hour. And then, you know, someone says, you know, we could go on a bike ride and we can stay far apart and we could go on a bike ride face to face. And, you know, so we set up a, a social distancing bike ride, allowing different folks in the team to, to, to bring in uh, their own form of leadership and their own form of connection, right, uh, allows us to get back to some of that semblance of normal for what, what our club was. So. Um, leadership can be a really good way uh, to, to start learning about the things that we don't know. Right? All right, so some of the issues that we're facing in the sport of rowing, um, we, we kind of range. It, it varies from stagnant to increasing diversity uh, in the sport, and that's true of, of rowing. It's true of many sports. Um, the, when we talk about increasing diversity on the face of that, a lot of folks might say, well, that's a good thing. We do have increasing diversity in a lot of different sports, but we don't necessarily have increasing inclusion. And that's 
as I we talked about earlier, right? That's that's the big hang up because you bring folks in who you know who maybe are not uh, traditionally seen in in uh, rowing or or other sports, and then but nothing changes in that sport or nothing changes in the culture or community, and they're like this isn't for me, and then they leave, right? So we're not paying attention to the inclusion piece. So that's what we need to see an increase in, right? Is the inclusion piece. Um, a lack of diverse representation in positions of power. So who are the decision makers? Who are on your board? Who are your captains? Who are your, you know, your outspoken club members? And what are we doing to make sure that we have, a, you know, a diverse group that, that has power? Um, how do we recruit and retain diversity from juniors all the way through to masters? Um, so as I said, we have the, the ERG ed program I'm from the George Pocock Rowing Foundation uh, in Portland. And uh, so we have 20 rowing machines that travel around to about 10 of our different schools. And um, we, we selected schools that have um, higher populations of students of color in particular, because we want to increase racial diversity in the sport of rowing. And we depend a lot on our juniors club to help us facilitate that program. And they have been absolutely amazing. Rose City Rowing is absolutely amazing. Um, we, we couldn't do it without them because it's not just about, oh, okay, we brought the rowing machines to their physical education class and they participated and they really enjoyed it. Well, what's next, right? Um, we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to participate in rowing. So what are we doing to make sure that they can take a class or um, join a team or come down to the boathouse at all. So, um, you know, our, our juniors club helps facilitate um, field trips so that we can get the students down and get them out in a barge and get them, get them on the water, right? Um, they've offered, um, you know, scholarships and free um, access to uh, their programs and their training camps and different things if, if you're an ERG ed student. Um, you know, so those are some, some they, they might seem like, like small things, but they're huge for a lot of our students. They have gone around and picked up students to make sure, driven a van and picked everybody up so that they could come down to practice. That means a lot, right? Um, when we're talking about, you know, a bus could take a couple hours to get somebody to practice. Um, and I know a lot of other ERG ed programs have done, have done similarly. So that's making some of those initial shifts to make sure that we're not just saying, hey, look, rowing is a really cool sport. And if you really like it, you can join, you figure that out. But we're, we're helping facilitate that process and getting folks to the boathouse. Um, but then, right, it's not just about getting the access. That's one part of it. But then what's happening at the boathouse? So you've, you've brought, you know, uh, young students in to join your juniors program. Um, they don't look like the rest of the rowers that are on the team to start off. So what are you doing to make sure that that environment is welcoming and inclusive? And, and that again comes from asking, you know, how was it? What's going well? What do you wish was different? Thinking about whether it's the music played or the, the structure of how practices are run or, you know, how you close um, your practice. There's a lot of different things that you can do to ensure that everyone is feeling valued and welcome. Then thinking about that transition. So we know that if you row in high school, your chances of getting a scholarship are extremely high in the sport of rowing, particularly for women, right? Well, what about that transition from high school to college? Because let's say you create a very um, a diverse juniors program, right? And it's diverse and it's inclusive, and they have had, you know, as a as perhaps an athlete of color, they've had just an amazing experience, and they get a scholarship and they go to college. They're going to go back to being, you know, one of one or one of two athletes of color on a rowing team. And what are we doing to make sure that they're going to? have that same success that they had in the juniors program at the college program you know and how much control do we have as a juniors program to when we have athletes going to colleges all over so you know it's it doesn't just stop once we get access or say oh look they were a juniors drawer we're good now 
right? Because then there's college and then you leave college and then maybe you go on to national team training or maybe you join a master's program. We have to think about each of those different spaces and how we're making them um, more diverse and inclusive to one recruit, but then retain that diversity. The whole point is rowing is something that can be done across the lifespan. I mean, we just added new age categories for masters up well up into the eighties. Like how are we making sure that that inclusion is, is a, is a lifetime thing. And that takes all of us. It takes all of the different clubs from juniors all the way through to masters and into the elite levels, making a conscious effort to create more inclusive spaces. Um, we, we tend to still have quite a bit of oppressive language, policies, and practices. Some change, some don't. It's really uneven the way that we change. Um, you know, it's really, it's really difficult. A lot of things are, are embedded in our practices. Um, you know, like I said, everybody, every team has a little bit of a culture. And so we really have to think about um, the language that we use, our policies, um, you know, and, and do they have unintended consequences um, for certain groups? So right now, here we are at COVID, um, we can only take out singles. This is true for, for clubs everywhere. Um, we're not a singles club. We, we row eights. Eights is our home base. We, um, you know, we're, we sweep band skull, but we're mostly a sweep club. We love to row our team boats. We can't do that right now. We own one club single, you know? Um, and so when we're, we were just talking about purchasing a boat and we had initially been talking about purchasing a double and now we're thinking maybe we should be getting a single because right, we can't control COVID, but if we're thinking, we don't know how long this is gonna be, we should be thinking about how we can be supported. Um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of folks in our clubs who have their own private singles, but there's also a lot of folks in our club who don't have singles or maybe don't even know how to row a single. Can we allocate our coach to be taking those folks out in an appropriate way and, and teaching them how to row a single? So, you know, policies and practices that we might have that unintentionally limit folks' access, right? Um, you know, so we, we want to think about those. We want to evaluate those as we go through. Um, working with athletes with visible or hidden disabilities. This continues to be a, a big issue for, for rowing programs. So we know that adaptive rowing has grown quite a bit. Um, what are we doing to bring adaptive rowing to our own programs? Um, you know, I, I've heard some folks who are very fearful, right? But what about the liability? But what if someone gets hurt? That's true of rowing in general, right? Um, you know, what are we doing to create an inclusive space to make sure that anybody who wants to row can row? Um, and so we, we want to think about uh, how we can how we can create that. It, it again, maybe we see something like a doctor or anything. Oh, it'd be too much. I don't know if we could handle it. We can always try it at least to get started because again, we're, we're talking about rowing. And, and if y'all are like, like me, like there's nothing that makes me feel the same, the way that rowing makes me feel. And to deny that to somebody is unthinkable, right, to me. Um, so, you know, we've got to do everything we can to make sure we can get folks, folks out on the water uh, if, if possible. Um, supporting masters as they age. This is this is something that has come up a number of times. Um, masters programs are really tricky. Like I said, we have members from 23 to 76. Um, what happens when your masters rowers age and maybe they don't want to race anymore, right? Um, but they still want to be a part of the club. Um, there's there's you know we want to think about how do we keep folks connected because the fact of the matter is. Um, for many folks, even from large clubs, because you kind of have your own little groups, even within large clubs, rowing teams are family. Nobody understands the way other rowers understand. So it's not, we don't want to get to a point where we're saying, okay, well, if you don't want to race, you can't be a part of our club anymore, 
right? Or or maybe that that rower has rowed for a number of years and maybe they don't really want to row anymore or they can't row anymore. Physically, they cannot row anymore, but they still want to be a part of the club. So what other roles can they help fulfill within the club um, to still be connected? Because again, when we're talking about aging and across the lifespan, that that connectedness is absolutely essential. I mean, think about people who've been a part of clubs for 30 years, 40 years, and then, then maybe they're not able to run anymore, they're not able to race. And if they're no longer a part of the club, that's, that's like being cut away from family. Um, and so we really need to think about, well, what other roles are there, right? They can, they can help in so many ways and they have so much that they can bring to our, our teams. Um, so, so supporting our masters as they age. Um, and then, you know, really when it comes down to it, there's a lot of varied commitment to creating more inclusive environments because it means change. And um, especially being a sport that has such a long history, we have a lot of tradition and a lot of this is the way things are done. And we can be very resistant to change. You know, um, and so it's, that's where we can run into a lot of issues is, you know, maybe some folks in the club are really committed to making a shift, some aren't. Um, you know, I've, I had worked with universities where um, I, was, I was going in to give a, a presentation and that just before, you know, I'm introduced by the athletic director, uh, they go, okay, well, yeah, you're about to uh, give your talk, that's great. Uh, as soon as I introduce you, I'm going to have to take off. Also, I said that the uh, football and basketball coach didn't have to come. Okay, um, <laughs> right? That's not saying that we're fully committed to an inclusive environment. So is everybody willing to participate and be a part of it? Um, because it really does take, take everyone. Um, you know, we, we need to make sure that from the very top, all the way to our down to our members, we are making a, a conscious effort uh, and a commitment to, to make change. Um, this is an article uh, that that's linked in the the slides here. It's called "Diversity is for White People: The Big Lie Behind a Well-Intended Word." And I want to read just a, a short quote from this because I think this speaks a lot to um, when we when we talk about diversity, just how difficult it can be um, to make change. Um, basically, it says, here's what I've learned. Diversity is how we talk about race when we can't talk about race. It has become a stand-in when open discussion of race is too controversial, or let's be frank, when white people find the topic of race uncomfortable. Diversity seems polite, positive, hopeful. Who is willing to say they don't value diversity? One national survey found that more than 90% of respondents said they value diversity in their communities and friendships. And so the question is, if we as organizations that support the sport of rowing value diversity, then why isn't rowing more diverse, right? Why is it still a predominantly white, higher SES sport? Why is it predominantly able-bodied, right? We have to be able to answer that because if we truly do value it, we should be seeing some shifts, but we're not. So we are missing out on that inclusion piece. We are missing out on really understanding what it is like to walk into a boathouse and be faced with people who don't look like you or don't have the same background as you, right? And what does that mean? And how do you feel, how does it become family, right? Um, and that's, that's where we have to build on the inclusion. The other part that we have to recognize is that what's happening right now is impacting um, our members, our athletes, our coaches. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift to a slide that I actually added last night. Um, so it's not gonna be in your, in your notes, but, um, but I, I just wanted to, I felt it was very important to talk about this. Um, so this is something actually our superintendent sent out that says that 
black lives that continue to be lost to racist brutality and the failure to recognize our shared humanity. That's, that's talking about what's happening right now in our communities, in our country. We can pretend that the, those events that are occurring, they exist outside of sport. They actually, they have nothing to do with sport. Maybe not, but they don't exist outside of our experiences. And when we're talking about creating a more racially diverse sport, those experiences in society impact, you know, our athletes, our teammates, our coaches. Um, they have an impact on how even our sport might be viewed, right? How safe a person feels walking into a predominantly white space, um, of which rowing is one. Um, and it's important that, that you consider your organization's values around social justice and racial equity um, and affirm a personal and professional commitment to those things if we really are going to make a change. So we can say, oh, we, we attended the diversity webinar, we're good, check. But it, that's not enough, right? Um, what's happening right now has an impact um, and we have to recognize that if we really do want to make a shift and a change. Um, so, if you're coaching athletes and you have athletes of color, particularly black athletes, and you're not talking about what's happening in Minnesota, you need to, because it's impacting them, right? Whether, whether you know, it's happening to them or not, or it's happening in your state or not, it's happening. Um, and so, we really need to think about that. We really have to have those tough conversations if, if we want to move the dot. So two major things that can be a threat to work around diversity and inclusion. Um, one is selective information processing. And uh, what that basically means is a lot of times when you bring up uh, an aspect of diversity or creating a more inclusive space, um, immediately people, the, the wall goes up. Like, oh, here we go. All right. So even if, you know, like I had the answer to all humankind, if you were forced to come on this webinar, uh, you might not even hear it because you're just like, ah, I already know what's going to be in this webinar. I don't even need to talk about this. Right. So we have to break through that, right? Suspend disbelief, right? Imagine that there is more for each of us to learn. Uh, and one possible solution is consciousness raising. So that is, again, talking about issues that are occurring both in society, in sport, and in rowing in general um, around diversity and around inclusion, right? And so that we are understanding all of these different experiences. Again, not, all, not just sport related. You can study um, you know, racial history of, of sport um, but it's also important to study the racial history of the U.S. or your particular city. Portland, Oregon has an extremely racist history and present, and that is very real, and that impacts our ability to bring the sport of rowing um, to our students of color. It means we have a lot of work to do, right? So we have to acknowledge that if we're going to make a difference. So consciousness raising is a big part of it. And it's not consciousness raising for the students of color. It is consciousness raising for those of us who are white, who are working with students of color, uh, to bring them into the Oregon program, and to maybe to make them into our juniors athletes, uh, and into our college athletes, and our master's rowers. Um, and then the other is limited focus of change. So oftentimes what ends up happening is we get into this space where, um, you know, especially when I worked with colleges and universities, like we might get one team who's like super passionate about creating more diversity and inclusive spaces, but the athletic department as a whole is not really interested, right? Um, that's tough because creating a, a diversity and inclusive space is more than just one team, right? So let's say one team is super passionate about it and then we all head off to head of the Charles together um, and 
You ever looked around and heard of the Charles, right? So, you know, it has to be everyone making a conscious effort to create a more inclusive space. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we really need to be thinking about. It can't just be one small group. It has to be broader. So change is hard. That is sure. Skills we can, we can work on, right? We are work with our coaches. Our, our coaches help us cha change. We grow in skill. That's actually more the easy part. Think of that as the diversity part. The inclusion is the mindset part. It's how do we change our mindset? Because for many of us, we're thinking right now, everything about my club is great. Everybody's welcome. Anybody can come. Anybody can join. Um, I, I read once, and this, I'm not meaning to throw shade on, on Boathouse Row in Philadelphia, but I read once that um, the boathouses in Philadelphia are open one day a year, I think. Anybody can come in and look and things like that. I'm a rower and I would feel intimidated just walking into a boathouse on Boathouse Row, um, let alone if I was not a part of rowing in the first place, right? Um, you know, so it's, it's like, how do we change that mindset? Um, everything's good, anybody can join. Eh, yeah, but, right, does anyone feel like they can join? So how do we address that? Um, when we forget about that quality experience, we're, we're missing out. So some of the things that we really want to think about are, um, you know, think of inclusion as our organization or our team health. Um, that's where we really need to, to think about change. So like my coach used to say, you know, um, when you come to the boathouse, you need to be like 100% focused, you know, you got to be present. So if you have like boyfriend, girlfriend issue or a paper due or something like that, check it at the door. You know, when you're here, be here. And, you know, that's fine for a boyfriend, girlfriend issue or a paper you have to write. But if I'm walking into a boathouse and I don't feel welcome because of a part of my identity, whether it's my race or my gender or my sexuality, whatever it is, I can't check that at the door. That comes with me everywhere. It is who I am. Um, and that means that I'm always going to be devoting some percentage of my energy to managing it, dealing with it, hiding it. Uh, and that means I can't give 100% to my training. And if I can't give 100% to my training, then my boat's not getting 100%, right? And that impacts performance. Um, and so, you know, we really have to think about how can we ensure that when we step into the house, um, we can be who we are authentically. And what do we need to do to make that happen? So dedication. Are we really truly dedicated to making a change? Because we know it's important, not because we have to, not because uh, USOC says we need to have a, a diversity outreach program. Like, are we really dedicated to make a change? Okay. Um, Fear of conflict is almost always a sign that something's not quite right. Um, when we avoid necessary pain, we fail to gain from the possible experiences that we could have, right? The long, the long-term shift. Um, and so if change makes us really anxious, it's usually a sign it's time to make a change, right? We need to shift things around a little bit. Imagine if we still rode in that big heavy wooden boat okay in bloomers as women um we wouldn't be we wouldn't be looking at some some ncaa champions right so are we truly dedicated to make the change and see it through so think about stereotyping because i talked about how we unconsciously will often stereotype and we have to change that behavior so stereotyping happens anytime we categorize somebody and we see somebody and we assign certain traits to that person. Every time I see somebody who's tall, I'm like, that person should be a rope, right? Um, you know, we, I don't know that person. I don't even know if they would be a good rower, but I just, they're tall. They should be a rower. Um, when we see someone, we assign traits to that person, okay? These are informed by, you know, all of our different experiences across a lifespan, right? 
you see someone and you you want to how do they fit in the box of my worldview all of us do this and in fact it's it's almost impossible not to do right you can try not to do it but it is pretty automatic it's how the brain works it likes to fit everything into its categories that's the first step of stereotyping. But the second step is where we can make the shift, right? That's the activation of the beliefs. So I see someone tall, I say they should row, and I just apply it, right? I've just applied a stereotype universally. All tall people should row. They would love it, right? I have no, no knowledge that all tall people should row or would enjoy rowing. Um, that's just, you know, it's based on whatever experiences I might have had. I'm tall, I like rowing, I'm good at rowing, um, and so thus everyone should enjoy it, right? The problem is, of course, I'm just talking about height, but when we use that same template with race or with the person, we see someone who has a disability or someone who's an older member or, you know, of, um, uh, any number of things, right? It's when we start applying those stereotypes universally, okay, that, that we run into trouble. That's where we can make the change, but we have to be willing to stop ourselves before we universally apply a stereotype. Well, we can't create a more uh, racially diverse club because people of color don't wanna row. Okay, but why? Right? So we're activating beliefs, we're universally applying it. Right? That's where we need to stop ourselves. Because we're stopping the opportunity to create a more diverse and inclusive space before we've even started. Right? So the responsibility comes from recognizing our current culture. So what is the current culture of your team, of a lineup, of um, a club, you know, of your organization, those, those are all different cultures and you've got to sit down and really unpack each of them, right? I have been a part of lineups, boat lineups, that when someone new came in, they were made to feel very unwelcome in the lineup, right? Um, I have been a part of clubs where someone new came in and they were made to feel unwelcome as a part of the club, right? Um, I've coached athletes who I've watched make others feel unwelcome and had to deal with that. So, you know, we really have to think about what is the culture of our club um, or our team or our lineup because the cost of that means we're not getting the best of the best because we can't even know this, this new person, this new group, this, this new program that we're bringing in. We don't, we can't even get the best of what they could bring because, you know, whether it's us or it's some of our members or teammates, they've already made their decision and they're gonna make them feel unwelcome. So we really have to think about our, you know, if someone came in brand new and they looked exactly like us, they looked different from us, they rode like us, they didn't roll like us, whatever, would they feel welcome in our space, right? And one of the things that we can we can think about is now this has to do with with um, with race, but it could be applied for for many aspects of identity, which is essentially where are we in the spectrum? If we look at our organization, are we in a space where we deny that that race or gender or sex or sexuality or ability matter? Right? Oh, anybody can join our team. Nah, everyone would feel welcome. It's good. Everyone would feel welcome. There's nothing wrong here. It's fine to thinking about when we have new members come in, we need to think about how we actively integrate them and their own experiences and their own culture as a part of our club, as a part of our team, as a part of our lineup. Um, you know, because there are often differences between where we actually are and where we think we are. Right? We often think we are much further along in the spectrum than we actually are. And that causes us again, not to create an inclusive space. So a lot of it has to do with what would it feel like to be the outsider? Um, I, when I was coaching at the University of Colorado, one of my athletes uh, was deaf. And she told me that the most valuable thing a hearing person could do would be to go to a deaf event because she felt like there were so few opportunities for 
uh, the hearing world to really be the, the outsider, you know, and to really experience what is that like. Um, and I think that that's a, it's a valuable experience. Um, and that's what we need to, that's the, the mindset we need to bring to it. If I were to walk into this club or if I were to join that team, what would it feel like if I was the outsider? Um, and, and, you know, and then again, the idea is, is that over time, as we become more diverse and more inclusive, then a person who is, let's say, a person of color who joins a team is not the only person of color on that team. Now there's more people of color on the team. Now the team is more racially diverse and the experience is more inclusive. And so again, over time, we're, we're trying to build to that space. Um, education, right? What are we doing to recognize what's going on, whether that's historically or right now? As I talked about Minneapolis, have you been reading about Minneapolis? Are you, are you working to understand the issues uh, that are going on, right? Not just, again, police brutality against uh, of the black community may not be happening in rowing per se, but it is happening and it does impact black athletes, right? Are we thinking about and reading about um, aging and what does it mean for our boomers who are in the retirement realm um, to join rowing, to learn to row at age 50 or 60? Um, you know, how do we keep them fit and active? Our master's programs, um, you know, looking at their workout plans and really thinking about how do I, you know, how I design my workout program for my 50s, 60s, 70s might need to be different than my 20s, 30s, 40s group, right? Are we thinking about how we can include athletes with disabilities in our programs? Right? what we might need to do or shift. Um, you know, all of those things are, are critical. It's, it's taking opportunities to, to learn. Um, I know, and I, again, I, I love this book. I love Boys in the Boat, wonderful book. Uh, I've got teammates from, the, you know, uh, went to the University of Washington, rode for the University of Washington. Um, and many people have read it. But have you also read The Red Rose Crew? Have you also read Sugar Water? You know, there are books about rowing and the experiences of, of African Americans in rowing, women in rowing. Are we also holding them up and saying we want to know more about all of these different groups and their experience for? Right. So it's it's from everything from what's happening in society all the way through to things that are happening in rowing, both historically uh, and today. Okay. Um, privilege. So also learning about privilege. Um, these are things that are, that are often true in rowing. Nearly any club or team I join, most of the rowers and likely the coach is going to look like me. Whatever club or team I join, I will not feel like I need to change my appearance, speech, or mannerisms to fit in. I can always afford to pay my club or team dues, racing fees, travel expenses. During social distancing, I can either continue to row in my personal boat and or train on my personal herd. Privilege, whether it's white privilege, male privilege, able-bodied privilege, it exists out there. And again, calling it out is not to invoke guilt. It is to say that these things are true. So how do we address them? We can't say, no, I don't want privilege because that's not really how privilege works, right? I am white and I experience white privilege whether I intend to experience or not. It is given to me because I am white, right? So it's about recognizing the privilege and then finding ways to either understand it or disrupt it. So. A very easy one that could happen right now. During social distancing, not everybody has a single. Not everybody knows how to row a single. Not everybody has an urn. So what are you doing to make sure that your athletes, your teammates have an urn or some type of fitness equipment? 
right? So we put together a, a fitness exchange at our club and everybody was to fill out a form and say if they had extra equipment that they could lend out to other team members to, to let us know. And then members could fill in and say if they were looking for equipment. Um, when we hop on the, the Zoom call to do our, our ERG workout, most people are on ERGs, but we also have folks who are running. We have folks who are doing um, like um, HIIT workouts. We have folks who are biking. Um, we've been lending each other bikes to do our social distancing bike rides. Again, making sure all of our machines are clean um, when, we're, when we're lending them out and things like that. But we're trying to make sure that everybody can still be participating and connected, right? It is a privilege that I have that I have my own ERG. So how can I make sure I'm, you know, extending that privilege to others? I don't have a second ERG, but I do have a bike trainer I could lend. Right? So that's what we're thinking about. When we talk about privilege, it's about recognition and about finding ways to shift and disrupt that privilege. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what we want to be thinking about. So attitude, this is just a clip from our early on when I sent out our, our fitness exchange, right? So it's important that our leaders also participate in this work. Um, and so we want to make sure that it's not just uh, those of us a sense on the ground, but that our leaders are also experiencing some discomfort, that our coaches are doing the work, that our athletic directors or our club presidents or organizational leaders are all doing this work. Um, so a lot of it has to do with, with attitude and shifting attitudes. So thinking about microaggressions. So when we think again about creating that inclusive space, Right? We want to make sure that everyone feels valued and included and heard. What often happens in a space without us recognizing it are microaggressions. Um, these are kind of passive, oppressive instances. Um, and for a lot of folks, when someone is called out because they have committed a microaggression, um, they, they're, they're kind of gut reactions like, it's just a little thing. Just a, it was just a small comment. I didn't really mean it. But the thing with microaggressions is it's kind of like death by a thousand, thousand cuts. If you are a person of color or if you are uh, LGBTQ, if you are a person with a disability, if you are a woman, identify as a woman, if you are older, you have often experienced many microaggressions throughout the day or the week or the months. And so that one more cut to that person who did it is just one tiny thing, but to you it's the thousandth beasting, right? They build up over time and, and oftentimes people get defensive because they're like, well, I meant it as a compliment, but it was really insulting, right? Um, Harvard did a, uh, there were students at Harvard who did a, um, like a campaign that says, I too am Harvard. And it was uh, students of color were posting the many things that they had been asked or, or said to them, uh, you know, about their, their presence at Harvard. Things like, where are you from? No, I mean, where are you really from? Right, when they would say, I'm from New York or something like that, right? Different things that, you know, on the surface seem harmless, but it's the underlying meaning behind the questions or the comments that, that is the microaggression. Um, they have a big impact. And so we really need to think about those, those instances because they happen all the time, right? So how do we, how do we think about that when we want to create a more inclusive space? So how do we interrupt them? And that helps build intimacy and trust in our clubs and in our teams. So always focusing on impact over intent. So when our gut reaction is to say, I didn't mean it that way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you meant it. It matters how it was received, right? So I have two kids and, you know, one bumps into the other and, uh, you know, and I was like, you need to say you're sorry. Why well, didn't mean to bump into her? doesn't matter. You did, right? So again, impact over intent. Your intention is not important. The impact it had is, and that's what we need to be focusing on. 
We want to build emotional skills. A lot of us who have experienced privilege, whether it's racial privilege, sex privilege, age privilege, we have not had a lot of experience being resilient in the face of hard conversations. It hurts to be called out. I work, have worked in diversity and inclusion for 20 years, and I have been called out and called in, depending on how you phrase it. And it's, it, is so, it is so hard because you're so disappointed in yourself or you're embarrassed. But it's so important because that's when we learn right um, and, and it's happened to me many times and each one of those no, it, they hurt of course but it's so valuable right um, and so we need to we need to understand that that is a part of our learning healing and repair we need to move away from this idea of punishments whether it's punishing ourselves or punishing others to healing and repair that's how we move forward and I'm going to give you a, a, a quick a mnemonic to remember how to do this in the next slide. And then commitment to social justice. So again, are we committed to social justice? Are we really committed to making a change? Or are we committed to staying comfortable? Because if we're committed to staying comfortable, it is going to be very difficult to create a more diverse, inclusive space. Um, we're going to have to push ourselves to be uncomfortable, to listen to a different type of music, to put different posters up, to serve different foods, to, you know, shift, shift some of the, the policies and practices and the way we do things. Um, because we're creating a space that's more inclusive and more encompassing of, of everybody's different experiences. So when we think about uh, and we are wrapping up, I promise. Um, when we think about um, making that shift, if we have committed a microaggression, if we have done something or said something that has caused harm, right? And we are going to do this. You are going to do it. I am going to do it. If we are going to make ourselves uncomfortable and make change, we are likely going to do this, right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't make change, right? So if we do something or say something that causes harm and we're called out, it's important to calm yourself. CPR, calm yourself. Because we're embarrassed that we said it or that we did it. We didn't mean it that way. But that doesn't matter because it's the in, it's not the intent, it's the impact, right? Remember that you're better than the worst thing you've ever done and we're worse than the best thing we've ever done, right? And we need to objectively look at what just happened, all right? So you need to take a breath and get the executive function back online. Then we practice humility like we, we talked about from the very beginning. Remember that to have a low to moderate opinion of our own importance here. Thank you for telling me. I'm sorry. Okay. Is there something that I can do to rectify the situation? I would be happy if you let me know at some point. Then stop talking. Once you have apologized, stop. Because what happens is we are so embarrassed we continue to talk and talk and talk and talk. And then we are now causing the person who we have harmed to have to process this whole thing with us. And that's not, that's not okay. So get yourself back online. Practice humility. Thank you for telling me. I'm sorry. The end, right? You can add like, I would be open to having a, if, if you would be open to having a conversation with me a, about this at some point, I would be open to that. Don't force someone to process with you right then. Again, you're the one who's caused harm. It is not their job to make you feel better, okay? And then to repair. So be genuine in accepting responsibility. And a lot of times folks don't, don't know how to go forward at this point. I've done it, I've messed it up, this is it, it's over, right? We can't really change, or we're never going to get it. 
once we have done our repair, then we can move forward. It's when we catastrophize, right? So CPR, calm, practice humility, repair, and you can move on. You are better than the worst thing you've ever done or said, and you're worse than the best thing you've ever done or said. It might be uncomfortable, but that is how we grow. So that's, that's what we need to do, right? Um, and that might happen multiple times, but again, that is how we grow. And if you're gonna change, change comes with, with all of those, those mix-ups and mess-ups. That's, that's how we get there. And then I just wanna um, kind of end with a couple of things here. One is, is motivation. I think it's really important that we ask ourselves why we are engaging in this work. Um, is it because you feel like it's the right thing to do? Are you trying to recruit or retain talent? Um, is it because diverse organizations perform better because I have to? I mean, you know, why are you engaging in this work? It's the same question as, as why do you row, right? Uh, again, this is my team. This is our, um, us on the head of the year row, um, us at our annual dinner where we give out uh, awards. Uh, last year, I was a recipient of the Flipper Award for flipping at the dock in my single, second time in my whole career. Uh, and the Twinkie Award, because I had to miss the regatta, and they won anyway, uh, <laughs> right? Why are we engaging in this work? You know, um, our teams matter to us. They have a lot of value, and so we really have to ask ourselves if we're committed to seeing this through and why we want to do it. Um, and those are things we ask ourselves all the time as the athletes, but we don't tend to ask ourselves when it comes to thinking about diversity and inclusion. Um, and then I'll just end with some kind of practical things uh, that, that, that I've learned over the years. Um, one is that you really need to work with individuals. You need to know your members, you need to know your team, you need to know your coaches, um, because you need to know who they are as people so that you can have those tougher conversations about creating more diverse and inclusive spaces. Um, and it stops you from making assumptions when you get to know everybody on the deeper level. You need to think about ways to keep aging members engaged. We are going to have more and more aging members. That's why we added age categories, right, for racing. We're gonna have more and more aging members um, that maybe, again, like I said, no longer want to race or no longer want to row or do want to race and do want to row. Um, you're going to have members who have had heart attacks and come back to continue rowing. We have several. Um, you know, how are you going to keep those members engaged, right? Because saying, oh, this is too scary. I, you know, I think maybe you're good here. You're done. That's family. You're, you're, you'd be separating them from their family. So how do you, again, keep those folks engaged? Um, again, as active members, as, as you know, um, whether they're racing or rowing or not, how do you keep them active in the club? Um, not physically rowing doesn't need to be the end of rowing. So keep asking questions, keep learning. That's in every single box because it's absolutely critical for creating diverse and inclusive spaces. Um, remember that not all athletes have the financial support to engage in teams at the same level. You know, whether again, from juniors all the way through to masters and into elites. Um, you know, something that, that really hurt me as a, as a young rower was I really wanted to go to a national camp. I wanted to, to train. I, I was like, I'm sure I can make national team. Um, and, and I remember talking with elite rowers and, and them saying, well, you know, this is what it looks like. And I was like, when do you work? And they're like, well, you pretty much just got to train. And it's like, what? I can't just train. I have to work so I can just train. You know, um, you know there's different financial commitments that we have to think about in our sport. Um, and whether it's elite training or it's master's level club dues or racing fees, you know, um, we have to think about all of those different things and what we can do to ensure that members who want to be engaged can be engaged. Um, 
mindful of mandatory requirements. Um, we have lots of members that have, you know, some have small families, some are retired. Um, and so the amount of time and commitment that they can make to a sport at any one time, it varies. And we have to be thoughtful around that. We have to keep diversifying where we recruit athletes from. Again, juniors all the way through, right? Are we, are we pulling from the same pool over and over again? We need to, to try something different to reach out. Um, you do the same thing, you can expect the same results, okay? We need to think about our assumptions, the assumptions that we make. Um, we need to have positive and strong leadership. Uh, we wanna build both inter and intra team strength. Uh, and we do that again by getting to know each other, by unpacking our biases and by having some of those tough conversations. Uh, communicate pride in all teams from your learn to rows all the way through to your elites, right? Um, everyone should feel, again, valued. They should feel like coming to the boathouse is something they get to do, not something they have to do. Don't, don't commit, uh, don't dismiss claims of harassment, whether that's sexual harassment, racial harassment, um, ability, age, if someone feels like they are being harassed or dismissed or discriminated against, take that seriously. Find out more and then ask, are we committed to making a change? Are we committed to making a shift, right? Um, making time and space for diversity and inclusion is, is critical. Um, training and engagement can help with retention. Being authentic with your change. If you're just doing it to check a box, People know, and they're not gonna be interested. Um, so be authentic. Do work with individual teams. Um, and again, in every box, like I said, keep asking questions and keep learning um, because that, that's what really moves, moves the dial and creates that inclusive space. And be in it together. That's, it takes everybody, so. Thank you, that's all I have. Well, that's that's great. Uh, th that was really great, Jenny. I uh, appreciate it so much. The uh, as as you were talking, I'm I'm working I'm uh, working on a uh, the pathway project for Sport for Life. So you know, like this is what this is what I'm doing. And as I'm going through these pages of the plan, I'm thinking, man, what does all this fit in? So I think you're not going to be rid of me for a while. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just so many I see so many places where we're so fixated on a result that we're not fixated on the connections between us. And you know, like winning is, winning itself is so abnormal, right? Like how many people actually win compared to how many people are taking part? Like, why do we love rowing? And you, you touched on it repeatedly. You know, we are actually in this for each other, the relationships. So when you're talking about, well, what do we do? What do we do with, um, you know, the, the people for, you know, who, who can't race anymore or, Sometimes you can't physically row anymore, but still want to be part because that's those are the ties that that bind us, right? I mean, it's not necessarily the wins and the losses. Um, you know, that fades. No matter how good you were, that fades. Uh, that's just yeah. the way it goes. Um, so I pr I'm very appreciative of of this this whole this whole topic and, and all the the ways it makes you think. You know, I mean, our boathouses are are are, are safe spaces for so many people. And if you look at it from the standpoint of the rower who happens to be black or, you know, a female or gay or what, whatever, whatever, you know, we're talking about, we have an opportunity that it's the safe place for them. You know, we need to, to lend ourselves to everybody who's, who's doing this with us. Um, we all do. So um, we do have a question or two. So let me, let me just see what we have here. Um, and I and I'm sorry, Jennifer. Uh, I know she, uh, Jennifer asked this back in one, at one thirty. How do you measure inclusion? And I'm not sure that I. I, I mean, I should have asked it then, and it just it just slipped by. How do you measure inclusion? Is there? Yeah. So I think that measuring inclusion is really tough because it's in in many ways you're you really have to. It's not something you can quickly survey and. and and done. I mean, you could certainly survey teams and ask them, um, you know, how, you know, how inclusion, how included do you feel as a part of the team? And you can kind of define for them what you, what you hope that inclusion looks like, right? Um, but a lot of it comes down to having conversations with athletes or with teams 
um, and, and really, you know, sitting down and saying, how are things going? What is working? If you could change one thing, if, if you could change one thing to, to make it feel more, you know, to make you feel more included as a part of this team or a part of this program, what would it be? Um, a lot of it does come from having those conversations. And so I think one is just when you, when you get to that point where folks are like, you know, I really do feel like we've got everything that we, you know, that, that I could want, um, you're, you see that you're moving the dial. Um, when you see that you've made a concerted effort to increase, whether it's racial diversity or ability diversity, and you see those numbers not only um, start to appear, but then grow and, and, and hold over time, that's when I think you also see that you, you are starting to be successful at creating an inclusive environment. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of everything. I would also say that, um, not that we all, not that we want to do this, but I think exit, and it's a type of exit interview is also good, um, is talking to those athletes who decide not to continue on with the team. Um, and, you know, and checking in with them and, you know, what is it that, that didn't work? Um, and again, for folks to be able to be honest with you, you have to have built a lot of trust. And so I think that's a big part of it as well. The, um, you know, uh, and here's, here's a, a, defa a piggybacker on that one is uh, suggested strategies for changing the non-inclusive leadership. You know, uh, the, the non-inclusive leadership mindset. Do you have any strategies? You know, our sport is, is also one of the sports that this is the way we've always done it, right? I mean, you know, and there are, there are a lot of places that have been, you know, they'll tell you, our boathouse has been around for over 100 years. Yep, and done it the same exact way for 100 years too. Like, I mean, do you have any strategies for how to deal with people like that? Well, I think, I think it is really hard. It is really, really hard. And I think that um, you have to keep pushing those conversations in with those folks. Um, you know, this, this is the way we've always done it, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, you know, maybe that is having that conversation. Maybe that's um, proposing that um, the club engage in a, in a diversity and inclusion type session or that, that um, the leadership attends a, a session at the U.S. Rowing Convention or, you know, something along those lines that, that starts to push them to, um, to, to move the dial. For some folks, you will push and push and push and they still will not be convinced that anything needs to change. But I think, you know, if you can start to even break down the walls just a little bit, um, whether that's stories or, um, you know, like I said, or trainings or things like that, um, I think it can start to open people up, right, to, to new experiences. Or maybe it's finding um, someone who is connected to folks in that leadership who they really respect and listen to, to kind of help guide them in that direction. Um, is, you know, think of it as kind of like a maze. I turned this way, it didn't work. All right, well, let's try turning this way. Well, Turn this way. It's just kind of that keeping keeping at it pretty doggedly to um, to really push them to think about how do we how do we change and be different. Um, if they really want to be think about it this way, the Olympics should be the best of the best. But the fact of the matter is, it takes a ton of money and time to train like that. So is the Olympics really the best of the best, or is it the best of who could afford to train? To be the best and the same is true with any club like if we want to get the absolute best we need to make sure that we have the opportunity to pull from any number of athletes out there um, if we keep it always the same even if we've had a lot of success imagine the success we could have if we could pull from anybody and everybody um, so i just say stay on it you know uh I'll, we'll stay in the same vein. Um, uh, Roman has a question uh, that is very specific to, to his uh, experience. Rowing is an expensive sport. Well, we can all agree. Uh, many athletes want to join our club collegiate program, but find the financial burden to do, uh, too great to overcome. Earlier, you mentioned that inclusion may be a priority of a team, but not the administration at large. And I feel this is the case of our club. How would you start this conversation with your university? Mm. 
I think I think that's a great conversation uh, to to be had with athletics. I think that so so all and I can't remember the um, the website, but I know colleges and universities there's a website where essentially how much is spent per athlete is actually um, it's public record. And so when you look at different sports and you look at how much essentially the university spends per athlete and then how much and then you are presenting to them not only how much is spent per athlete, but then how much are your athletes spending to be a part of the sport, you know. Um, and so I think it's important sometimes to present them with those numbers like we spend X number of thousands of dollars on football players and the out-of-pocket expense for football players is minimal. But we spend minimal on a rower and their out-of-pocket expense is, is out of control. So showing them that disparity I think can be can be helpful. Um, I think that you know that you're you're almost having like you want to you want to increase the diversity in rowing and you know that you have these athletes who would like to be a part of it and they can't and that's the heart reason unfortunately athletic directors and presidents that they're not always motivated by the heart reason maybe they're more motivated by the winning and the notoriety and the alumni money that might come um, and so maybe it's framing it to them that imagine if all of these folks were able to join and imagine the prestige that would bring. We would elevate our level of competition. It potentially could bring um, higher connection to our university and that translates to alumni dollars. It's, it, feels, it feels cheap to sell it that way, but if that's the way that motivates um, you know, a university to say, I want you to invest in these young people now because they may invest in us later. I, my, my college cut women's rowing, I cut rowing all together, but they cut women's rowing a few years back and I want nothing to do with my university anymore. And that's really hard because rowing was, that was at my, my heart. Um, and so imagine, you know, they know that, that athletes who feel connected to their sports at the college level, they, they many universities live and die by the, the alumni donations. Um, and so I think that's another, that could be a, another possible in, right? They're making a small investment now for a bigger payoff later. Switching, uh, switching uh, to a different uh, topic, especially right now, this is, as a coach, what's the best way to reach out to your black athletes right now? And what is the best thing to say or not to say? Like, I mean, it, the world's blowing up in our face. Yeah, I think that it's more, I think less is more in terms of reaching out to your black athletes and saying, I'm seeing what's going on. I am, you know, I'm beyond words. I don't even know what to say. And I just wanna make sure that I'm checking with you, that you're okay and that you know that I'm here. I think that it's not so much that there is something specific to say or do, but that your black athletes know that you see what's going on and that that, and that you're recognizing that that could be having an impact on them. Not even could be, a, it is having an impact on them. That that's the life that they're, that, that they're living. And if they're, if they're a, especially if they're a, a black male athlete, um, that that is a real fear that they live with every single day. Not that black females don't live with that same fear, but um, but it's been particularly salient, right, in the uh, in the in recent experiences. And so I think it's just about reaching out and showing that recognition that I see what's happening. What's happening is not okay, and I just want to make sure that you know I'm here for you. And I think I think this would be the last one. Uh, how do you bring a small sculling masters club together when it's split between those in long-term leadership and newer members that are provided uh, little input and therefore, you know, creates a, a problem with retention? Control is always top down. And I think this is actually, you know, I, I'm hating to say this, but I come across this a lot. This is fairly normal. 
So are you saying um, there's longtime members who kind of have all the, the power and new ones come in and they're feeling um, like they don't have any say? Is that? Yeah, that's the way I'm reading it. And Karen, you can jump in, but that's the way I'm reading it as well. And and if it is the case, that's more normal than uh, than you'd think. Or, I mean, I, I found it to be quite normal. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've seen that too and I've seen I, I've seen when sometimes when the push comes too much right then that creates that split in clubs where the mem you know maybe some of the older members uh, that have been around a long time kind of like ah that's it we're out we're, we're gonna do our own thing um, and I think that that you have to recognize that that is a real possibility especially if you've got a group who's been in power a long time and really does not want to change um, but it's again, it's that, that idea of uh, if we don't change and we don't grow, we will eventually disappear. Like, a club, you know, eventually we, we, we will no longer be able to row because we'll be dead. <laughs> like, I mean, right? So we, we need to bring more members in and that means bringing in younger members or less experienced members. Um, and that means also having to share power. And so I think one of the ways that we need to deal with that, one is to call it out and to talk about it. You know, that, and that's a tough conversation to have. Say, I get it. You all have been here a long time. You uh, have a certain way of doing things. But the fact is our goal is to grow and to get better. And that means some of us, some of you are gonna have to give up some power and give up some control. Um, and if that's not their goal, if they're like, well, we don't wanna grow, we don't wanna change, then, then that's where the organization itself or the club itself really has to say, okay, well, what are we about? Because if we are about um, you know, building up a, a robust team, then we have to be able to retain athletes. And that means we have to make shifts because we're not able to retain them right now. Um, and if that's not something that the older folks that have been there a long time want to be a part of, then that's not the right club for them anymore. Um, and that, that's hard because, right, because then you lose you, the potential of losing members. But I think you do have to call out that elephant in the room. It says, we have to know that these are our values. And in order to achieve, achieve those values, we have to be different. Um, and different looks like X, Y, Z. And, uh, and and I know that that change is scary. And maybe it's talking to them about why that change is scary. I know for, for members, especially when you combine boats of lots, you're maybe a smaller clubs where you have lots of different boats and things like that. Older members can get fearful that younger members are gonna replace them in a lineup or in the best races or whatever it might be. Um, maybe it's, it's sitting down with them and talking about that too. It's what, what is the fear? Why is it that we don't want to change, um, you know, and, and understanding where they're coming from so that you can address some of those fears? You know, the other thing, the other, there's, there's many other parts of this that are much more complex. You know, it may be that the club, Karen, that, that you're talking about, you know, they have no need of other people's money. They have no need of, you know, every, they, they, they control all the things that matter and there's no more, there's no mortgage to pay off. There's no anything. Um, and it may be that you can't change them. It may be that, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I, in New York, we, we have a lot of uh, groups where the masters are just content with the way it is. They don't want new members. It's not, I mean, most of them row singles, right? I mean, they're not looking for, if they want a new boat, they'll buy their own boat. They're not looking for input even, you know. Um, other ways to look at it, Karen, would be if there are bylaws. If it's a not-for-profit, they've got to have bylaws. They've got to have procedures and protocols. You, you might want to access by looking that and, and seeing how, you know, how the board of directors is chosen in those bylaws. And there might be some nuggets in there that you can look at to, um, to affect change. Um, and, you know, but if it's something as simple as, look, the same group of people own, own the boathouse or effectively control the boathouse, it might, there might not be an answer for you. Um, <laughs> it might be that simple. Uh, and you might find another way to get access to the water, do somewhere else, something somewhere different. Um, you might have one. Uh, as a black male U.S. rowing referee, I am super minority in this sport. I'm wondering how many people attended this webinar today. 
Uh, Dave, there were 78 people signed up for this webinar today. We've had people drop off. Um, you know, uh, it, it varies. You know, some people say, I'm in for one hour, you know, and that's what I budgeted in my day. And, um, you know, we're, what, 45 minutes past time, and there's still 40 people uh, people on. So um, I, hope that, uh, I hope that helps uh, your answer, Dave. Um, you know, as I said earlier, also, we're, we're, uh, we've made it a point to have, this month is going to have several talks um, around a variety of ways to get different people involved in rowing. And, and um, you know, it's funny, Jenny, today I got an email out of the blue um, from a, uh, a group called PASS, P-A-S-S. -S, and what they do is they, they fund, um, they help people with lower incomes and more diverse backgrounds have access to sports. And they said, you know, hey, we. And I was like, oh, please come to the, please come to the webinar. You know, like here's a link, you can get right in. And I, it was probably last minute, you know, to to get them in. But um, I feel like there's so many dots out there that we can connect that we don't even know are out there to connect, and uh, we can do so much more. Um, so that's why these talks are so important. Um, Dave would love to to meet you and have in, more uh, more uh, uh, interaction with you and and get some thoughts as well for the future. So. Um, Chris.chase at usrowing.org. Please do reach out and let's let's see what more we can do together. And that goes for everybody on the call. Um, well, Dr. Jenny, thank you very much. This has been awesome um, and and so so impactful. Um, you know, like the you know all the webinars we've done in the past up to this point have been I, you know, um, have been about you know the catch or this or that. And there's so many different variations, but truly transformative things, you know, or uh, we've got to, when we, when we get access to them, we've got to like, you know, clutch it with both hands and see what we can do. And this is one of those, you know, truly transformative topics that I think we all need to look at. So I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Uh, one question might, oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. All right. Well, y'all will have a great weekend. Be safe and healthy wherever you're at. And um, we will look forward to seeing you soon, I hope.